This week, on Sunday, November 27th, 2022, I started a self-imposed challenge. Create a game in Godot Engine version 4 in just 4 weeks. Here's how week 1 went. The night before, I'm feeling really drowsy with a sore throat and congestion. This can only mean one thing. This challenge is cursed! Sure enough, I wake up in the morning, and it's gotten worse. To add insult to injury, we're supposed to be having a birthday celebration here today. I have to just stay holed up in my room while I work on my game. However, that gets off to a rough start as well. Almost immediately, I was experiencing frequent crashes of the editor on my Pop! OS Linux installation. It honestly probably has a lot to do with the GNOME desktop environment, always a thorn in my side. However, I wasn't about to just deal with this all month, so back to Windows it is. I'd gotten a basic 3D scene set up, and it was almost immediately after that I started hitting some major roadblocks. I, uh, don't know how to make 3D games. Like, okay, I've done it before, but that was before. And surely too much has changed from Godot 3 to Godot 4 to just be able to steal that code, right? So I persist in trying to make something even remotely usable from scratch. For a long time. It never really panned out. 2D is so easy. I should just do that instead. Hey, why don't I just... No! So I haven't mentioned it yet, but my goal here is to make sort of a mix between Mario 64 and Castlevania. A 3D action-adventure platform game. I think it'd be fun. Problem is that anything other than a first-person view complicates the fuck out of programming your character controller. After sitting at my desk for a solid 20 minutes doing nothing but trying to come up with ideas, I decided I should try seeing if I could just isolate the base movement mechanics from my jam project called Speedster. Long story short, it didn't pan out well. I think I genuinely will need to just try to rebuild that system from scratch. It could totally work too. I tried just increasing the acceleration and lowering the top speed, and it felt really nice. But after nearly 7 hours of pain, I needed to call it a day. I'm sick, I'm tired, my head hurts. Tomorrow I'll have to come to a decision. I've got a few routes I can go down. I could buckle down and make what I set out to, compromise on my vision and build a first person game, throw nearly everything out and make a 2D game, or build the project in the more mature and stable Godot 3. All of these routes have different pros and cons. I'd comment on which one I want to do more, but honestly, I have no idea. I need a rest up for tomorrow. If you guessed that I would buckle down and make what I set out to, you'd be correct. It's amazing what just sleeping it over can do for you. Instead of trying to extract working code out of my Gold Speedster project, I just went for the source. The Godot 3 Platformer 3D Demo. Genuinely, referencing this was how I got started with that project. And it's paid off here as well. Of course by referencing I mean stealing the code, but hey, you gotta do what you gotta do when you don't know how to 3D vector math. It's MIT licensed anyway. I ran into another snag though. Movement in relation to the camera. This was solved through a lot of trial and error, and it's still not perfect. Oh my... I How long did it take? Two hours? I've got ideas on how to fully remove the issue, but I'm not gonna bother for now since it's definitely usable as is. Some tweaks to the physics, tweaks to the player model's turning code, and bam, it's starting to come together. Slowly but surely. After those three hours of trial and error, I decided to take a break before continuing. After a break, I decided to get to work on making the player model. I'm sorry Gold Speedster number two, you'll see the light of day eventually. Part of the reasoning behind making a different player model is that I want it to fit into a low poly aesthetic better. And Gold Speedster number two is a lot closer to Dreamcast than PS1 or N64. Anyway, uh, wow, look at the time. It took a little longer than I thought it would, but I was really indecisive on what the design of the character should be. I'll probably revise it some more, different colors at least. For now though, I can just say it's another iteration of the Gold Speedster type characters, who I really need better names for. After eight and a half hours of work, I really ought to get some rest. No way I'll finish this thing if I'm crunching on day two. Okay, an update here. There's actually a really nice tutorial by Devlog Logan for a third-person character controller in Godot 4 that's more or less what I was initially trying to make. I'll put a link to his video in the description. Check it out, he's got some other neat videos as well. Question time. What do you do when you can't get hair physics working? 
A, let it stay broken because it's funny, B, fix it loser, or C, just don't have the hair move? Stay tuned to find out the answer. I really backed myself into a corner by giving my character hair, since it meant I was going to have to figure out how to get hair physics working. Long story short, I didn't. My first stop was the old Google machine, which wasn't working very well since our internet's been down since the start of this challenge, and mobile data is slow as balls because we don't have an unlimited data plan. I fucking threw a fit as I was writing this, good lord. Anything related to hair and Blender itself seemed daunting and also likely to not give me the result I wanted. In reality, what I wanted was soft body physics applied to this part of the mesh. Godot actually can do this, but as you'll see, I had issues. <laughs> uh, that's funny. So the first major issue was just for me not being observant. Why is the hair not staying on the character? Because he didn't attach it, dumbass. Next issue, the hair keeps popping in and out of existence, seemingly at random, though it seems to be influenced by the camera angle. Hoping the issue would magically solve itself, I pressed forward. Collision is fucked. I tried several things, a box, a cylinder, a capsule, and everything that resulted in this. Weird jagged hair that isn't what I wanted. Could this be addressed by subdividing the mesh further? Perhaps. But since I actually never solved the where did the hair go issue, and nothing seemed to work, I actually went with option D. Just hide the hair. After that mess, I finally got to work on some more animations. And by more, I mean two. The walking animation was relatively quick to make, and I think it looks pretty decent. The running animation became a whole mess and a half though, namely noticing issues with the mesh and skeleton, trying to fix those, and then Blender's animation system shitting out multiple times. In the end, this is the running animation I'm left with. I really don't like it, but I'm not going to just sit here for another hour working on the animation tonight. Last thing I did today was get the animations playing in game, and getting them to adjust their speed based on the player's movement speed. That's it for tonight. I need some rest. Day 4 started off great. I made jumping, falling, and landing animations, got them into the game, and made a lot of refinements to player movement. However, as I was trying to implement Mario 64 style triple jumping, Windows blue screened. I thought, okay, no big deal, I barely lost anything, it's been a few hours, I'll just take a break. To my sheer horror when I returned, the player script and scene, as well as the test map, were all corrupted. And by corrupted I mean all their data had been replaced by zeros. Due to my shoddy internet, I hadn't been frequently committing to my private GitHub repository, which meant I lost a good half a day of code. I'm lucky I've been recording the entire process. This could have been a whole hell of a lot worse. But it was a really close call, and one I'm sure to take measures to prevent from happening again. So I got everything back to the way it was, except for the test map, which I just recreated from scratch since there was barely anything in there in the first place. While I was at it, I also fixed up said Mario style triple jumping, added variables for speed multipliers, and made the rose gold material on the player character actually resemble it somewhat. Didn't get much more than that done. But hey, yesterday was Tuesday. Maybe Thursday I can sleep. I think I'll do that before I get ready to work. Day 5 was almost going to be nothing. I woke up, got ready for work, left for work, left work, got dinner, came home, ate dinner, and then I decided. It's time for the state machine creation race. Finite state machines are a staple in game programming and design, and for good reason. They allow for clean and easy to understand organization and compartmentalization of different actions or states of a particular element. A good state machine implementation can really speed up content creation. For example, want to add a new attack for the player, add a new attack state, tweak the necessary parameters, and off you go. Want to have an enemy behave identically to another one, but with one or two extra abilities? Now you only have one area of code to edit when you want to change something related to both. There's a lot that makes state machines useful, and admittedly I'm probably selling them short. Let me sell them even shorter. Your game may not actually need a state machine. If you wanted to make a clone of Mario 1 for example, you don't need a state machine. All Mario does is stand, walk, run, jump, crouch, and shoot a fireball if he has a fire flower. All of that can easily and comfortably fit into one script. State machines are primarily useful when you're working with a large amount of potential actions and interactions between said actions, or when needing to make entity behaviors common and reusable. If your game is too simple, you may just be needlessly complicating and bloating your code. My game definitely needs a state machine though. 
Like I said previously, the goal is to make sort of hybrid between Mario 64 and Castlevania. To go more in depth, I plan on having at least a few different weapon types, each with their own movesets, both in and out of combat. Let's say that I was only going to have a grounded attack, an aerial attack, and some sort of special ability for three weapons. That's nine different actions that need to be swapped around and still work. That would already be hell to implement well without a state machine, but there's likely going to be far more than just three changeable actions. Granted, it probably won't get much more complex than that before the deadline, but I'm dreaming big here, alright? Initially, I was having trouble figuring out how to organize the current code into a state machine setup, but I eventually figured it out. What I've done is as follows. The previous ground and air movement processes have been moved into their own functions within the player script. I had to move the variables they use into the main variable pool for this to work, but nothing bad should come of that. The assignment of the HV, horizontal velocity, and VV, vertical velocity, variables back into the velocity variable has been moved into its own function, which also calls move and slide. And this function is called at the end of the ground and air movement functions. Each state will call one of these movement functions every frame. And each state has if statements managing when to move into other states. I haven't fully re-implemented all the movement yet, as I ran out of time in the night. The Mario 64 style multi-jumps are currently absent, as well as the sprint feature, both of which will be reworked to an extent, but that's a discussion for later. I should have internet again by tomorrow evening, so that'll be nice. Day 6 was a big load of nothing. I waited and waited for my internet to return, and I spent most of my time just prepping for the creation of this video, which is likely going to be all I do tomorrow as well. Alright, day 7, Saturday. I've recorded this whole voiceover right after getting home from work, so if I sound out of it, that's why. I made a bit of a blunder with my recordings here, so I've got giant several hour long clips to sift through. I'm gonna have my recordings auto split at 30 minute intervals from now on, so that'll be much easier to deal with. For now, the video is gonna look lazy because I'm running out of time for the week. I may or may not actually get more dev work done today, but that's all I'm putting in the video. Thank you all so much for watching, and tune in next week for another progress report. I'll see you all then.